welcome. Welcome. Welcome to First Parish Unitarian Universalists of Arlington. We choose. We choose. We choose to be. A liberal religious community. Welcoming. Welcoming. Welcoming to all. We encourage each other on our spiritual journeys. Support one another through the changes in our lives and challenge the excesses and injustices of our time. Called to love, to love, to love, and upheld by joy. We live our faith. into a time of prayer. I invite you to place your hands on your lap and open and close them gently as we breathe together, opening our hearts to the bigger possibilities. Take a breath. Open and close, and open, and close. It's time to let go, and let come. The season changes. New England move towards, moves towards winter with dramatic shifts in temperatures and colors and holding space for the change is complicated. Change can be scary. Change can be scary. It may mean coping when that's a challenge. Maybe the feeling of powerlessness is literal, like Puerto Rico, where 70% of the island is still dark. Or, where the diagnosis is terrifying to name or even consider, or when the thought of being responsible for another human being becomes profoundly overwhelming. A deep breath. Open and close. Let go and let come. Change can be hopeful. It might be the joy of a next generation, a new home, a steady recovery, or good news, a deep breath. <sighs> Open and close, let go, and let come. Let change be the inspiration of kindness, of care, and of compassion. Let change bring us patience with ourselves, with our community, with our world. And let change be a chance to hear wholly, to atone and to forgive for ourselves and for one another. Let us be ready for change. A deep breath. Open and close. Let go and let come. As the sun slips beneath the horizon tonight, a new year will begin. It is the Jewish New Year, or Rosh Hashanah. Did you catch that? The new year, in fact, every new day in Judaism, begins not at sunrise, but at sundown. I take some delight in this reminder that so many of our ways of thinking are arbitrary. 
What if you were to change some of your most basic assumptions about how life works, even when the very day begins? Why not begin in darkness, a place of germination and birth? Life naturally begins in darkness, and only in time yields to life from the earth, from the womb. But I digress. It is the new year. It comes at the end of the harvest, at the beginning of autumn, as we start to gather round fires for the colder season. In our Western secular world, we think of New Year's raucous festivities. But across many faith traditions, the beginning of a new year is a time to take stock. And Judaism does this with great flourish. A new year begins with 10 days of reflection, of repentance, a review of our behaviors, and a renewal of our commitments. It is a spiritual re-upping for another year. The 10 days start with Rosh Hashanah and end with Yom Kippur. In keeping with the Jewish tradition, I invite us today to join in a litany of atonement written by my recently deceased colleague and leading Unitarian Universalist minister, Rob Eller Isaacs. Now let me explain. A Jewish practice during this confession is to make a fist with your hand and after each wrongdoing is recited, to hit or beat your heart once. You might think of this as a way of waking ourselves up from a kind of spiritual or emotional numbness. And after hitting our heart, we will say, we forgive ourselves and each other and begin again in love. Try that. We forgive ourselves and each other and begin again in love. We will stand during the litany, and when it's done, you may sit, and then the choir will sing the Alveno Malkenu. The Alveno Malkenu is to the Jewish New Year what perhaps Silent Night is to Christmas. It is recited multiple times on Rosh Hashanah and Yom Kippur. I included an adaptation of the Hebrew for the Avenu Malkenu in the order of service, and that's both printed and available online. But frankly, the words may matter less than the melody. The tone of the song communicates repentance, blessing, celebration, mourning, passion. So if you'd like, you can turn to reading 6. 37, and stand, if you are willing and able. And we can begin. I will read the first line. You may hit your heart and then respond by saying, we forgive ourselves and each other. We begin again in love. For remaining silent when a single voice would have made a difference. We forgive ourselves and each other. We begin again in love. For each time that our fears have made us rigid and inaccessible. For each time that we have struck out in anger without just cause. Forgive ourselves and each other. We begin again in love. For each time that our greed has blinded us to the needs of others. We forgive ourselves and each other. 
we begin again in love. For the selfishness which sets us apart and alone, we forgive ourselves and each other, we begin again in love. For falling short of the admonitions of the Spirit, we forgive ourselves and each other, we begin again in love. For losing sight of our unity, we forgive ourselves and each other, we begin again in love. For those and for so many acts, both evident and subtle, which have fueled the illusion of separateness, we forgive ourselves and each other and begin again in love. Thank you. What did you feel? What did you feel listening to the, to the Alvenu Malkenu? A story. 30 years ago, Sarajevo was under siege. For centuries, Sarajevo was a city of three religions. Amid streetcars and pastry shops, Muslims, Jews, and Christians, Croats and Serbs lived together. But civil war broke out. The electricity and water supply to the city was cut. Bombs fell, leaving ruins and pockmarked buildings. The former Olympic playing fields were turned into makeshift graveyards. The streets were quiet, except for the sound of crackling gunfire. But one day, in the streets, came the sound of a cello. The lead cellist of the Sarajevo Opera Orchestra was playing. He was playing in honor of 22 people killed the day before by a mortar shell as they lined up for bread at a bakery. The cellist was nearby when the shell exploded and he helped to take care of the wounded. Now he has returned to the scene of the carnage dressed as for a night at the opera in a formal white shirt and black tails. He sits amidst the rubble on a plastic chair, his cello propped between his legs. Yearning notes float up to the sky. Rifles fire, machine guns crackle, and he keeps on playing. He will do this for 22 days, one day for each person killed at the bakery. Somehow, he is never touched by the shells or the bullets. He says, you ask me if I'm crazy for playing a cello in a war zone. Why don't you ask them if they are crazy for shelling Sarajevo? Other musicians take to the streets with their instruments. What do they play? They do not play martial music to rouse troops against the snipers or pop tunes to lift people's spirits. They play all Benoni's Adagio in G minor, a piece that is set like the Alvino Malcano in the minor key. The musicians seem to say, we are not combatants. We are not victims either. 
We are just humans, flawed and beautiful and aching with love. Music set in the minor key so often conveys the longings of the heart. We long for peace, for love, for meaning and purpose. We long to belong. It is said we are a people in exile, in exile from nature, from our true selves, from love. And we are longing for Mecca, for Zion, for Eden, for home. The British poet and novelist Vita Sackville West wrote, homesick we are always for another and different world. What did you feel listening to the Avenu Malkenu? It may be hard to put into words what we experience when we hear this kind of music. Perhaps it is sadness, but what I feel is love, a deep kinship with all the other souls in the world who know the sorrows the music is straining to express. Those moments when your self fades away and you feel connected to all is known spiritually as transcendence. Musically, bittersweet moments, music set in the minor key, like the Avenu Malkenu, may be among the closest we come to experiencing such transcendence. This is the human condition. We stand between what is and what should be in the world and in our lives. I think of those of you at work here in town on police reform. I think of those of you longing to leave the hospital this week, of those longing for the health and well-being of a daughter, a son, a child. I think of you longing for a renewed sense of purpose in this chapter in your life. And I think of you longing to forgive and to be forgiven. We are as people naming our sins, our shortcomings, and we long for better versions of ourselves. We long for the way things were or never were and what they might be. We long to be of use. We long to be seen and to belong. We long for connection. We long for the presence of the transcendence in all things and we long for another way in the world, a beloved community. But the experience of longing can be hard. We can get mired in longing, wallow in longing. We can find ourselves in desperate moments in the waiting rooms of life, in the times of great loss, in the dark hours of the night that perhaps we fear will never end. And there we may fall to temptation that is grasping for relief, for mistaken objects of our desire. It has been said that the core of addiction is a spiritual longing. Maybe so. Buddhism speaks much of false attachment, 
The Buddha warned against the cravings that arise when we try to make an object of desire more than it really is. But Buddhism also teaches that if we stay with the desire, instead of running from it, we can come to recognize that what we really want is far deeper and important. What is your experience of longing? When I think of my own longing, two experiences come to mind. One was a middle-of-the-night moment when all seemed dark. I felt terribly lost and alone, and I longed for some reassurance, some conviction that I could carry on with grace. Those hours of yearning stretched on. Morning did come, but it would take far more time to get my bearings back. That was a dark night of the soul where the longing was hard going. Another experience of longing is that of mine, of my being on a sailboat as a child. My dad is at the tiller, and I am at the bow with my legs dangling over the edge toward the water. It is a precarious position, and I am loving it as the boat cuts through the waters. The wind is blowing in my face, and I am looking toward the horizon. I am longing for something I cannot name, some time to come in the distance. Now, of course, no one ever actually reaches the horizon, but that matters not to me on the bow of the boat, my feet catching the spray of the water. That longing is magnificent liberating. Perhaps no tradition speaks of longing more than Sufism, the mystical tradition of Islam. The great Persian Sufi Attar, writing a thousand years ago, said, the one who does not yearn is like a wall, dead with no living force inside them. For Sufis, yearning is a gift, a gift of grace. Coleman Barks adapted this poem by the Sufi we know as Rumi. One night a man was crying, Allah, Allah, his lips grew sweet with the praising until a cynic said, so I have heard you calling out, but have you ever gotten any response? The man had no answer to that. He quit praying and fell into a confused sleep. He dreamed he saw Kadir the guide of souls in thick green foliage. Why did you stop praising? Because I never heard anything back. But this longing you express is the return message. The grief you cry out from draws you toward union your pure sadness that wants help is the secret cup. Listen to the moan of a dog for its master. Listen to the moan of a dog for its master. That whining is 
the connection. There are love dogs no one knows the names of. Give your life to be one of them. Listen to the moan of a dog for its master. This poem invites us to consider longing not as the absence of something, but as a companionable presence, like a tune set in a minor key, wafting through the air. The mystic invites us to consider the possibility of spirit speaking to us in and through our longings. And perhaps prayer isn't about talking to God at all, but instead is about listening to our longings, cultivating our longings. And perhaps our being together in religious community is about tending the longings in each of us. What do you long for? And how is that longing connected to how you are living your life now? What if you and I held our longings like one straddling the bow of a boat and looking toward the horizon? What if during the next dark night of longing, we were to say, ah, yes, there you are again, visiting me, sitting with me for a time, calling me on. What if we were to trust the longing state to ride its waves with grace, patience? What if we were to know the deep kinship of others who have longed and long still? That would be the picture of faith. Listen to the moan of a dog for its master. There are love dogs of many names. Give your life to be one of them. Listen to the tune of the ages. There are longings of many names. Trust the beauty and the power therein. In longing, we know communion. <laughs>